Hello, everyone, and welcome to How to Chess, a weekly chess improvement podcast and YouTube show. Every week, we try to dive quickly into a topic that can either help your game or expand your chess knowledge, or sometimes both. I think that this week, we'll be able to do both for you. We are joined by someone that I'm a big fan of. He is a USCF 2400-rated player. He's rated 2600 on in Blitz on chess.com. Every time I look, his rating has gone higher because he's always working on his game. He's a FIDE master, the Massachusetts State Chess Champion, a former poker pro, a data scientist. He consults for a company called Chessable.com, and he writes a chess newsletter called Zwischenzug that you guys all should subscribe to. I really enjoy reading it and always learn something. And he's going to be talking about how analytics and analysis can help your chess. So without further ado, let's welcome FM Nate Solon to the show. Hey, thanks, man. How's it going, Nate? Going good. Yeah, exciting. Okay, so we're going to dive in. Nate knows the drill. We've got 10 minutes, and we're going to talk about the difference between analytics and analysis. Nate, are you ready for me to start the clock? I'm ready. Okay, so question number one, Nate. What is the difference between analy- analytics and analysis? Yeah, so this is this is a distinction I, I kind of made up, but for me, um, analysis is what we do all the time in chess. Like when we go over our games, try to find the best moves, try to find what should have happened uh, with perfect play. Whereas uh, analytics is looking at not so much perfect play or what should have happened, but what actually happened in real games between humans. So, um, you know, we know like Moneyball, like baseball has been transformed by analytics, basketball, the stock market. And I think in chess, we, we think of ourselves as being really analytical and we are in terms of analysis, but we still don't do um, that much analytics comparatively, I would say. Like we, we don't do a lot of looking at the data of what's happened in real games between humans and learning from it. Um, so yeah, that's, that's sort of the key difference for me. Okay. Yeah. So of course we all like to look at our games, ideally do a postmortem with the person we played against, something like that. But this is like the, the macro, the big data trends that we can gather from our chess games and shout out to your cat for making a cameo yeah. there, Nate. That was um, Ramsey's. No. Um, <laughs> yeah, no, I just wanted to say, yeah, that you made a good point that I think an analysis is, is more focused on one game, whereas analytics would be the big picture many games, both, both both all of your own games or potentially all of the games from a population of other players at your level. Excellent. Yeah, Nate, I know that with your background as a data scientist and, of course, a former poker pro, you're uniquely qualified to tell us how club players can use analytics in their own games. Yeah, I, so so there's a few ways. I think um, maybe the, the classic answer would be chess-based. That's what professionals have used for a long time to create a database and sort of look at their games in the big picture, but um, it's not free and it's also, it's pretty hard to use. So I, it's not always the best solution for amateurs, I think. Um, Lee Chess, the, the Lee Chess Opening Explorer can be really interesting um, because you can go in there and look at opening performance um, by different rating levels. Um, so that can be really interesting to see what openings perform well at your rating level or what moves are most common at your level, because often like, you know, the quote unquote book move or the, the best move, the move that grandmasters play usually lines up pretty well with the most common move at the grandmaster level. But, but if you go in and look, you'll find it changes a lot as you go through the rating tiers. Um, so I think it's important to be ready, not just for what's supposed to be the best move, but also for what your opponents are most likely to play. Um, and then the third one I would say is uh, a relatively new one. Aim chess is really interesting because Whereas those first two, you kind of have to click through yourself. Um, aim chess is a thing that like automatically pulls your games, um, like your online games, and and does an analysis and then presents the results to you. Um, so they're pretty new, but they've they've recently been acquired by Play Magnus, I think. So I think tools like that that do more of the work for you and don't require you to kind of click through and guess and and put a lot of work in to get any results out uh, are are really interesting. And I think we're going to see more of those um, as people continue to work on them. 
Yeah, it's it's amazing to see all these new tools explode. And I think the point you raise about looking at within your own rating class is a really good one because, of course, you know it's nice to know what the engine best move is. But if it's if you're not going to see it very often, you might be better served by um, using analytics to see what you're actually going to face. It doesn't always just mean the best move. Now, Nate, of course, you're a pretty strong player, so you're in kind of maybe a different situation than some of the people listening. But let's start with your story. Can you think of an example of where analytics helped you personally? Yeah, so, chess, you know, of course. Yeah. What, what I was looking at recently was, um, you know, I sort of I set something up to, to look at how I was performing in my openings um, in terms of what came up the, the most often and where I was struggling. So just to me, that that's where I want to focus my efforts. Like if there's a line that happens a lot and I'm not doing well, like that's the line I need to fix. Um, and I found that as, as white, I was really struggling against um, the Banco and the Queen's Gambit accepted. So, so that was one where the data kind of matched my, um, what I was thinking. Cause you know, I had it in my notes, like, uh, you know, I hate playing against the Banco. Um, so when you can, when the data and sort of the, the story line up, that kind of gives you some more confidence because like sometimes in general, you do better in the openings you enjoy playing, but not always. Um, and as a poker player, you know, you know that your memory of, of the game, especially over trends over a long period of time is highly fallible. Like often what you remember about what happened is not what happened. So I think, you know, I had sort of a general sense, like I don't really like playing against the Banco. But to see that it's actually coming up a lot in blitz games, and I actually am performing poorly against it over um, a fairly long period of time, kind of gives me some more incentive to say, okay, like I should prioritize fixing my repertoire against the Banco. Um, whereas, like in contrast, I've been playing the Catalan as white and really enjoying it and feeling like I'm getting great positions. But when I looked at the data, my results are not like especially good in the Catalan. So it, it's also interesting when, when the data doesn't back up what what you assumed or thought. So that's that's maybe something you can sort of dive into more deeply too. Interesting, yeah. So of course it's kind of like in science where you have a hypothesis and if you test it and if it's confirmed you feel better about it. But if you don't, maybe you're on a little shakier ground. Now of course, Nate, a player of your strength, as you mentioned, it's going to come down to openings fairly often. But I think a lot of people watching this show. Um, it might come down to other things. They might the data might tell them something else. So, can you think of some other examples of things that people can look for trends in their games, whether it be as you say from Aim Chess, which collects it yourself, them like for you, or from uh, just um, t- you know sitting down for a couple hours and looking for data trends within um, say forty of of a given player's games. Yeah, I think actually Aim Chess is really good for this because it'll tell you. Um, you know, it sort of breaks down your games into different facets, like, um, you know, tactical shots or um, end game or, you know, different areas that, that you might want to look at. Um, and yeah, you're, you're right. The, the opening, you know, if you're, if you're at a lower rating level, you probably don't want to spend as much time on the opening. Um, so I think, yeah, unfortunately, a, l- a lot of the other tools out there don't make it... Um, easy to do this, um, that, that easy to do this in an automated way. Another thing I think is really good to do when you go over your games is to like, you know, something that you requires a little bit of effort, but is really helpful is just for every game in particular, every game you lost, um, choose like one thing that decided the game, like a single category, like I missed a tactical shot or, um, you know, I didn't know the plan in the middle of the game. And then what will, what will often happen is, if you actually do that over a period of time, um, often you'll find that th- there's sort of a trend emerging that like the same maybe one or two factors are actually causing a very large number of your losses. And then you can make a point of addressing that when you study. Yeah, that's that right there. I think that's like the number one piece of chess improvement advice that people, you know, everyone is always looking for tips tips to get better, myself included. But yeah, the secrets are all within your game. So yeah, and it's easy to get 
uh, bogged down on sort of the the micro view of, oh, I missed this tactic, but sort of zooming out and thinking about the situation where the tactic occurred or the type of tactic and looking for trends in that regard um, can really help your game, or so I hear. I, I, <laughs> <laughs> it may, may not help mine, but in theory, it should help the games. Um, so before we wrap up, the clock is running, Nate, but I did want to bring it back to openings and see if you could maybe give a few opening tips of... Uh, uh, openings that you think might be undervalued from your uh, data analysis for, say, a player rated 1,400 and maybe a player rated 1,800, just for example. Yeah. yeah. You know what I think is something really interesting that you can pull out if you even just look at the Lee Chess Opening Explorer is um, below around master level of the four most common opening moves, like E4, D4, C4, Knight F3, the ones that score, the, there's actually an inverse relationship between how popular they are and how well they store. E4 is the most popular, but C4, you know, the English and Knight F3, the ready, actually score really well, um, which is maybe, I would say, objectively, those moves all have similar value, and at lower rating levels, C4 and Knight F3 um, are less common, so maybe there's some surprise value there. So I wouldn't just take that and blindly switch to those. Um, maybe, you know, your style, you prefer to play more classically, but I think it's at least an interesting data point of maybe people aren't ready to face those slightly less common openings. Aren't ready, R-E-T-I. Yeah, sorry, exactly. Sorry, I, ha- I had to do it. <laughs> That's a really good insight, though. And can you think of any, like, oh, where are we on gambits? We only got a little bit of time, but how to, oh, in fact, we flagged. Yeah. So we'll have to leave it there. But uh, Nate, thank you so much for, for all your insights about uh, analysis and analytics in chess. Okay, thank you. That was fun. And we are back with our three improvement takeaways from FM Nate Solon. Of course, there's so much that we could learn from uh, this gentleman. He's got a lot of insights. But here are the three things that I'll be thinking about based on our quick conversation. Um, number one, the, the idea of filtering by your rating level when you're using an explorer like Lee Chess or something like that in order to see how you do, um, you can... by in that way, you can test to see openings that have success at your level. And again, you don't want to be spending too much time just on openings, but it can give you some little tips of maybe maybe stuff to explore when this is going to be a theme in another one of my improvement takeaways. But next up is look at your own data. So of course, as Nate mentioned, aimchess.com does a great job collating the data and telling, giving you some takeaways. But whether you subscribe to something like that or just do it yourself, the key is you want to be looking for trends in your games and weak points that recur over and over again and try to take a, a macro view, a big picture view of those trends. And that way you can use data to try to become a better chess player. Um, Number three, when it does come to openings, consider uh, going off the beaten path. Uh, the the example that Nate gave of uh, the op- the first first four different first moves you can make being um, having success inversely r- proportional to their popularity, I thought was really interesting, and I think that there's there's a lot to be learned from that. So, like Nate said, that doesn't you sh- mean you should automatically start playing knight f3 on the first move and winging it from there. But if you're if you can find a sound opening that is less popular, it might help you catch your opponents off guard. So. Great stuff from Nate. I'm sure I would love to hear more from him. So thanks again to Nate. Check out his newsletter called Zwischenzug. We will link to it in whatever description. And Nate, thank you again for joining How to Chess. Okay, thanks so much, Ben. That was really fun. 